Good morning, students. I hope everybody's doing well today. We're getting into some warmer weather, so that's nice. But with, with the change in the weather and all that, we, we have to remember that we don't have but, what, a couple more weeks in this term. And I want to encourage everybody to continue uh, to work consistently. Uh, of course, dealing with the online instruction and everything that, that has ensued in the last year, it has definitely been challenging for, for all of us. But I do want to commend most of you uh, on the uh, second test. The test was well done in the sense that I saw some improvement. Um, I do, however, want to encourage you to go through the uh, test solutions and make sure that you have understanding of the techniques. Again, I saw really good understanding. However, I think at certain points in the test, you just started to get a little bit winded and, and, and gave out. But uh, I will uh, also comment on the uh, problem. Uh, let me share this with you. There was a, a problem having to do with a product, and I thought that was interesting. Let's see here. Let me let me do the share screen. So in the solutions, and I and I considered this to be the case when I actually assigned it. Um, in number 11, I said something like, okay, use the series you already know to multiply to find the uh, McLaurin series for sine x, cosine x. But a lot of you just said, well, you know, I'm gonna use the, the identity like we did for cosine squared and just use uh, one half sine 2x, which is equivalent to sine x, cosine x. And of course, I didn't say how you had to do it. And so I thought, I was interested in seeing you multiply the series, kind of like when I did the long division uh, in lecture last week. And also one of the uh, uh, blackboard problems, I had e to the x sine x, which again, it pretty much made sense that you'd have to multiply. But if you use the identity, you got the exact same result. And of course, it, it didn't take as much time. So I thought that was a, a good use of of efficiency, but but I, I didn't insist on the multiplication method, so that was fine. Um, I will also say that that in situations where, um, of course, there were times when I didn't see your computations, and and I kind of let that go. Uh, you all, in general, need to work on computation. Uh, that's where most of us are, are suffering, and when I say most of us, I'm referring to the class. Uh, I try to teach my pre-cal students to compute uh, and they fight it tooth and nail, uh, but I tell them that it's an important uh, uh, strategy to be able to do. Uh, one other example that I noticed, um, the, the problem with the uh, convergence, conditional or uh, absolute, uh, this problem was actually done fairly well, but, but a lot of you just didn't complete the, the argument uh, testing the actual uh, absolute value. But, but again, I saw many, many threads of understanding, which I was extremely happy to see. Uh, there, there is some growth going on, and that's really important. Um, for number three, um, Again, when you do the comparison, you're having to look at this particular sequence, uh, generating sequence, and, and this diverges, uh, but you have to show me that. And I don't think any of you were able to do that. That would require the, uh, the integral test or some test. I mean, you could say, oh, well, it, you know, it diverges, but, but we're not kind of at that level. If I'm testing you on infinite series, uh, you need to show that part. Now, if this were in a, an example where you were doing an interval of convergence and you were trying to move the problem forward, I could say, all right, okay, we've done an example like that so you can get away with it. Um, number four, 
was interesting. Uh, this actually diverged because of the divergence test, and it was fairly simple to show that. Uh, so if you miss that problem, please, please look at that. Um, the, the other examples, um, I thought the first one was interesting. A lot of you use the ratio test and I didn't quibble about that, not much. Um, and that was fine. And then of course, number two, I was very pleased. Uh, I had one student to break it up into two uh, uh, series and I thought that was really neat and, and used basically the same argument that I did. Um, as far as the, the parametric equations, I just gave you a simple problem, which several of you missed, which was uh, again, amazing because it was so easy, but maybe maybe it was too easy and that's why it was difficult. Uh, but otherwise I was very pleased. Remember the, the construct about using the geometric series, which was kind of our bread and butter. Uh, that was something I focused on a lot and I actually wrote this problem based on the example I made up during lecture. So, so again, uh, I, I was pleased with the test overall, ladies and gentlemen. So I appreciate your hard work and I appreciate the fact that you are moving forward with your understanding. Just remember, we have the final exam, which I'll put up an announcement uh, uh, this week, which will occur at the end of next week, just like when we have regular tests. And the, the same testing window will ensue. I just have to agree on the days I'm going to give it but I think they'll probably be the same. Um, the, the one thing that's really important is that remember that the final exam is comprehensive. So, so as we learn the new material that's left, and then as we think about the final exam, think about the fact that we've got the old test. I'll do some review the very last week, next week, uh, but start assimilating all these ideas the final exam really turns out to be the easiest test of the, of the term. And remember, it counts 30%. And 30% is more, it's like two and a half times a regular test. It's a huge, huge part of your grade, okay? Uh, you've never had a class where you've had a 100% final or even a 50% final, uh, I have. And, and that's not always the most comforting uh, thing, but um, it certainly kept, Professor Ron on his toes, because you really never know what to expect in that kind of situation. So you overstudy and that turns out to be, you know, the, the, the blessing in disguise. So, so again, I appreciate your hard work on this test. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you don't always feel that the hard work is borne out in your grade, but, but I, the deduction of points was not as severe as in, in the previous test. And I did see at least an effort of of, of, of making an effort to understand and some good threads of understanding. Just be sure to go through the solutions and, and clear up any issues that you may have in, in the strategies. Now, what I wanna to do today, and I think you're gonna like this, um, the, the material on uh, polar coordinates is, is actually kind of fun. And again, I think you're gonna think you're in a, a, a physics class, the idea is when we talk about polar coordinates, we're just really running back to, as they say, uh, the basic trigonometry of the unit circle, but we're looking at the coordinates a, a little bit differently than we did in trig, but we're gonna keep all the things we knew about trig because that's gonna help us as we move from our polar coordinates to our Cartesian coordinates. So what you're gonna find here is that you probably already understand most of this. And so this is gonna be uh, really good. Now, now, of course, when we think about this, we're, we're interested at least in terms of moving the polar coordinates into the Cartesian plane so we can think about parametric equations. And when we have parametric, we can apply the calculus of parametric you know, the dy dx. So we're gonna do that too. And that's gonna allow us to, to basically push the calculus into this new coordinate system and do what we've been doing all along. So the idea here, let me adjust this just a little bit. Here we go. I'm kind of picky about how this is. I, I wanna make sure I've got plenty of 
screen room here. Okay, excellent. So what we wanna do is think about what seems to be an XY coordinate system. So what I'm gonna do, and if, if it helps you, just think about this point here as being the origin of the XY coordinate system. Okay, so, so we're, when, we, when we look at the polar plane, we're really gonna be thinking that we're just slapping the XY coordinate on top of it to kind of keep everything oriented uh, in the perspective. And that will not be incorrect, at least in terms of moving from Cartesian to coordinate uh, excuse me, moving from Cartesian to polar and vice versa. So if you think that way, it's not incorrect. We just have to make sure that we keep the two separate. So for instance, we're gonna call the origin that we normally think of when the XY coordinate system, the pole, okay? We're gonna talk about tangents at the pole and that's basically just gonna be uh, tangents at the origin, so to speak. So the pole becomes the origin of our usual XY coordinate system. And then the positive X axis becomes the polar axis. And so we're thinking of this as the positive X axis, positive X axis. Sometimes it's listed as, as positive polar axis, but the polar axis is basically just looking at the unit circle and looking at the positive x-axis. And when we think of, of creating a distance along the unit circle or the abstract concept of an angle, we think of moving in the counterclockwise direction as positive and in the clockwise direction as negative. So that will not change. So, so again, think of this as the positive x-axis where we basically begin any distance along the unit circle or any angular distance. So that is completely the same. Now, of course, you know why it's done this way, because if it weren't, then we can't make the connection to what we already know. So someone actually did think about this. Now, when you, when you consider that, you can say, all right, well, what, what, if, what if we started putting in the rest of the coordinates or the coordinate axes? We just dot these in. So we could think of the polar axis as theta equals zero, if we're gonna use theta. And we can think of the positive y axis as theta equals pi over two. And we can think of the negative polar axis or the negative part when we usually think of the x axis as theta equals pi. And then of course, the negative y-axis as theta equal three pi over two. And then of course, you could add multiples of two pi and, and you see that these are clearly not unique. So, so the idea is that we're gonna use the same concept of angular distance that we used in trigonometry. So that's not gonna change. So what, what's the polar coordinate gonna be? So we define we define the ordered pair R theta as polar coordinates, polar coordinates of a Cartesian point or I could say Cartesian and I'll just say I left out pair of course. We define the ordered pair R theta as polar coordinates of the Cartesian ordered pair X, Y. So, so it's like, oh, I see what you're doing, Professor Ron. You're gonna, you're gonna look at R theta and it's gonna have a correspondence to a point in the xy plane, okay? And so when we define it, what, what's r, you know, what's r? We kind of know what theta is, but here's what we'll have. We'll say where r 
element of the real numbers is a directed distance. There's so, you, you, can, you can describe polar coordinates many ways, but it's good to think about it in terms of this correspondence and the way I've started it here, where our element of the real numbers is a directed distance from the pole, from the pole. So for instance, we could have a directed distance from the pole that terminates here. We would call that R theta. And then of course, there would be an angular measure here, theta. So then of course, you're thinking that eventually we could, we could consider coordinates this way if we were thinking in terms of the unit circle and trigonometry where this would be a right angle. So that's coming. So we have R a directed distance. Now, when I say directed, that means that R, if, if, if it's a real number, can also be negative. So that's, that's actually not what we've been doing, okay? We, when we think about distances, we always think about distances that are non-negative. So polar coordinates is, is more flexible. And that's what I was saying before. Uh, polar coordinates will also be intertwined with cylindrical coordinates, or you will still have that same directed distance. Now, this just offers us more flexibility, but it's new. It's a little bit new. So a directed distance from the pole and theta element of R is the angular distance. I feel like I'm teaching trigonometry angular distance measured from the polar axis. Again, the polar axis is just thought of as the positive x-axis. So if you just want to impose the x-y coordinate system, you're thinking now, oh yeah, I see why that's pi over two and that's pi and that's three pi over two just like thinking of the unit circle. So all of this is combined in a synthetic way so that everything we've already worked on, we're gonna be able to use. So polar coordinates were, I'm sure, you know, something that was thought about long before it was actually written down formally. Um, but, but again, we, we get to use all of the nice ideas that have been generated over the years and, and, and can benefit from that knowledge. Now, when we'll do some examples here, but what's important, what's important here is that when, when I look at this coordinate, this is in the this is in the first quadrant, okay? And so you can think, all right, well, you know, there'll, there'll be like an X coordinate and a Y coordinate if we think of Cartesian. So we can say this corresponds to some x, y coordinate, okay? Just like I've written here. So we're thinking with these polar coordinates, we might be able to describe certain curves in a simpler way, maybe in a simpler way. Maybe the description of a Cartesian curve will be more complicated with polar and we're like, eh, don't care so much about that. But we can always take Cartesian curves and make an effort to convert them into polar and vice versa, uh, which, which again will be something that you will do also in your mathematics courses and also in engineering and physics. Now, this directed part needs a little bit of attention and I'll show you what we do. How do we, how do we work with negative R? So I'll just say fix, fix R, element of the real numbers where R is positive and theta element of the reals. So theta is what it is. So that, that doesn't matter. We theta, if theta is negative, we don't care. We know that just means that just means a, a clockwise uh, motion from the polar axis. So that no big deal there. But R being negative is a big deal. So we define, and you can think of this like vectors, ladies and gentlemen. You, if you think of it, if you think of it this way, where you take an R and, and uh, as a vector, 
And when you take its additive inverse, you simply reverse its direction. It's like a 180 degree shift. You just flip it around. And now instead of going pointing in this direction, it points in the opposite direction. So that's how we can think of the negative R. So we'll say that negative R theta will be considered the same. And when I say equal here, equal in the sense of, of equivalent. <laughs> It's not like I'm saying two, three equal negative two comma pi over two equals some positive number. It, it's it's going to be equivalent in terms of what we've described here. So it, you, you take it with a grain of salt. So of course this will be R and then we'll have theta plus odd multiples of pi. Where the usually the most convenient one is to use uh, either um, in this case, n equal to zero or n equal to uh, negative one. So we either get a pi or a negative pi. Those seem, seem to be the most convenient uses. And again, n is, a, is an integer. So, so the idea is that when you have the negative r, you equate this with equivalency to this particular uh, coordinate. And you basically do a projection through the origin, just like thinking of the vector. Like, for instance, we could have negative 3, um, 7 pi over 6. This will be equal or equivalent to denote the same point. If we use this, this will be 3. And then, of course, we can we have to add the multiple of pi in this case. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna subtract and so I can stay in zero to two pi and that's just gonna give me pi over six. So the idea here is that you might be asked to do a problem where you, it is required that your coordinates, as far as the thetas are concerned, fall in the range zero to two pi. And so in this case, if I'm going to find an equivalent here, I can make the R positive, and then over here I can choose the uh, negative one for uh, N to give me the negative pi here. Okay, so so the idea is that when I think about this, these describe the same point. Now I'm being a little bit sloppy here, and let, let me not just make the the x the x coordinate or x axis like I normally do. Let me just do the polar axis like this and then probably better, even though I'm sure I'll not always dot these. Sometimes we just won't worry about it and just draw the lines because, you know, we're, we're, we know what we're doing and we're just trying to make it easy on ourselves. So for instance, here, if we have this point, say we can think of, in this case, roughly pi over six. So, so when, we, when we draw this line here, this directed distance, we're not saying that's part of the point. We're just saying that that's how we get to the point. And then of course it, it creates a triangle, but the focus would be here three and then the pi over six as the angular distance. And then, of course, the, the thing is, when we look at the negative three, seven pi over six, we're thinking this way that we shoot through the origin and go here. So if I just want, if I just want the point here, I'll just take three, seven pi over six, and that'll give me this point. But when I have the negative here, we project through the origin and we see that this is equivalent. That is, these are equivalent points negative three, seven pi over six. So that's how we interpret the negative R. Now, of course, like I said before, if I just want the point here, I'll just take this point to be three, seven pi over six, if that's the point I'm interested in. But of course now this is in the third quadrant and these are both in the first quadrant. So the beauty of the negative is that if we have polar graphs, we can interpret the negative in a systematic way that, that, that blends with what we already know.
So, so again, this is the only thing that's new. Everything else pretty much looks the same. And this is why I like to take a little bit more time with this. Well, I say that about everything anyway. I take more time with everything because mathematics is not rote memorization, it's understanding. And, and I'm glad you all are starting to see that. So, so the idea is that it looks like all the trigonometry is the same. So let's go ahead and write that down. And then we have a way to figure out how we interpret the negative R. That is, if we fix a positive R, negative R is clearly less than zero. But again, even if it weren't, I'm, I'm trying to focus on when this is actually negative, but even if it weren't, it would still work. The negative uh, can still be transferred through this process and you get the same thing. It just seems to be a little bit backwards. So I'm just focusing on the fact when this is indeed less than zero, but it wouldn't matter in general. So now let's go back and, and see how we connect everything. That is, if we think about the polar axis here, and we just go ahead and think about our pi over two, three pi over two, pi. So again, we're thinking R theta. All the examples we've done so far, R has been fixed and theta has been fixed. But if, but if theta is free, we're gonna get a circle, right? I'll talk about that. that that's gonna make writing circles or certain circles very simple. So for instance, if we have a fixed R and theta, as I have here in the first quadrant, can be in any quadrant, we can, we can always do like a reference triangle. So, so now what we can do is think of this particular value that is, if this is going to be the theta and this is going to be the R, this basically imposes a right triangle. And so using trigonometry, we can just define this distance to be X, that's R cosine theta. Well, and of course now it's gonna be a directed distance, right? Because R can have positive and negative values. And then of course this directed distance will be Y equals R sine theta. So this is what we don't have in trigonometry, even though students always write, write triangles in other quadrants like that makes any sense. You really just have to think of a reference triangle and keep track of the signs based on the quadrant. Uh, again, somehow that seems to be how things are taught on the internet, uh, which is actually incorrect. Um, but at least when it comes to polar coordinates, we do have the luxury of the directed distance and R can actually have values that are, are negative. But again, when it still comes to the triangle, we're still focused on the actual uh, non-negative distances. So there, that's a subtlety, but it's a mathematical subtlety that is often uh, just not even uh, figured into the argument. But but that's a story for another day. So, so what we can see here is that if we think of making the connection here, we can say polar to Cartesian. So we could say that if we start with polar, we can multiply R and cosine theta to get X, which is a Cartesian coordinate. So now again, of course, we can say this also equals X, Y in terms of the Cartesian. So now Y is R sine theta. So now, of course, since we've got these directed distances and all, then, then truly this gives us a blueprint for rewriting uh, the polar coordinates in terms of the standard Cartesian coordinates. So we say polar to Cartesian. And then of course we can flip it around very easily using right triangles. And then we say Cartesian to polar. 
Very simple. So now we just go back over to the right triangle and we just say, well, we know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So now if we, if we extract the positive or principal square root, we can define r in this case as the principal square root of x squared plus y squared. So, so, so when, we, when we do this, really what we should do is just do plus or minus, but this just gives us the value of r, so-called absolute value, okay? Because we know r in this particular case can take on negatives. But in terms of absolute value, this is more than sufficient. And as we move things around and throw in negatives, we know how to interpret them. And then of course, using uh, basic trigonometry, we know that tangent, and this is, this is a convention here, ladies and gentlemen, tangent is used uh, in a conventional way here. Tangent of theta will just be y over x. And so now we can apply the inverse tangent and define theta to just be the inverse tangent of what y over x. And then of course, this lies, this lies between negative pi over two and pi over two. And then of course, if we were needing to move this around, we could add multiples of pi to push it into the correct quadrant, just like we uh, do with Professor Ron's lemma from pre-cal. Um, the idea here is that we have a blueprint to move uh, from Cartesian here to polar, we have a blueprint to move from the uh, polar to the Cartesian. And you're gonna do this when you get to spherical coordinates and cylindrical coordinates in calculus three. It'll be the same thing. And you'll find that there'll be times when you particularly like a coordinate system over the other because it may be easier uh, to write things uh, in that particular coordinate system. So let me just do a simple example here. So what, what I've written here is just say to write, write Cartesian coordinates. Write Cartesian coordinates. So in this particular case, we've got the polar coordinates negative four, negative three pi over four. So, so again, I'll just say given, let me just write here, given polar coordinates. I mean, you don't, you, you might not really know the difference if, if things are not given in terms of pi or something, you, you, you may be thinking, well, maybe that's, Maybe that's the Cartesian. It certainly could be, uh, but we're, we're given the fact that we're starting with polar coordinates. So what we could do uh, just to make this a little bit more manageable uh, to use uh, these constructions here, we might think, well, what's an equivalent? What's an equivalent uh, polar coordinate uh, pair here that will render our uh, are positive to make our computations a little bit simpler, even though it's not required. Let me let me just show you. So for instance, here we could say that this would be equivalent to four. And then of course we can just add multiples of pi. So to make to get it in the positive realm, zero to two pi, let's just add pi and that will give us, well let me write it out, negative three pi over four plus pi which equals four pi over four. So these, these two polar coordinates represent the same point in the plane. And you can see that the polar coordinates are not unique because of, pop, because of the theta, because of the angle measure, which is not unique from trigonometry. So, so again, this is the same as this in terms of the point that it represents. And so if this is polar and we've got polar and we want to go to Cartesian, we can use this. So let's just first start with this. So we have X equals R, which is four times cosine of pi over four. And so this will be four times one over root two 
So that's just two times two over root two. And of course, one of the root twos absorbs into the two. Usually I'll just factor that, but I think you know my methods now. That'll just be two root two. And then we have y is now four sine of pi over four. So again, we get four times one over root two. Well, we just seen that calculation. So this is two root two. Now, of course, it wouldn't have mattered. I just wanted to go ahead and make this, this change via the definition so you could see that. But had we started here, notice we would have x equals negative four times uh, cosine. Now, now here's, here's an interesting thing here. That's interesting about this. When you look, when you look at this, and then you think about what we're doing, I want to, I want to make a comment. Second. When we, when we think about how we construct all of these problems, and and we now see that we have a directed distance, we can actually move this in a way that transfers all of the algebra into the coordinate that identifies the angle. So when we have a negative R, we can replace it with its additive inverse and then add a multiple of pi, an odd multiple. And usually it's either one or minus one, just just for convenience, and we get this. And so when we think about the actual uh, coordinate, you know, we're, we're fine. Now, now here's something that's kind of interesting here, because when you look, when you look at this and you think of, well, how, how, is, how is the uniqueness of a point borne out with the polar coordinates? When you think about it, you're saying, okay, well, I could rewrite this many different ways because I could change this by multiples of two pi and, and write infinitely many. You can't really do the same with this. So when you look at this coordinate pair here, you're thinking, okay, well, we're good to go. We, we have our uh, Cartesian coordinate pair right here, which is in the first quadrant. Now, when we look at this, and let me go ahead and write these down. Now, when you look at Y and you think about how we've done this in this particular construct, we see we get what? We get negative four, and then we get sine of the negative angle. So this is going to be a negative sine, three pi over four. And again, of course, the sine is positive in this quadrant. The, the reference angle is the same, but we'll just say this is negative, negative. So this is a negative four times a negative one, and we have sine of pi over four. Again, this is in the second quadrant. Its reference angle is pi over four, and it's positive in the second quadrant. So we get four times one over root two, which is two root two. And now here we do the same thing. But I, want, I wanted you to see, and I didn't want you just to think that I give you this definition and, oh, it's correct, you know, it's fine. But the definition is based on the mathematics we've already set up. So now, now let's do the same thing we did here. I thought this would be easier to see because the arithmetic is easier. And so here we get negative four and we get cosine now, now, in this case, the negative absorbs because the cosine is what? Even, so we get cosine of three pi over four. This is in the second quadrant where the cosine is negative. So if we use the reference angle, we get negative four times the negative 
of cosine of pi over four. Again, remember the sine in the second quadrant is positive, so we do not affix a negative. The cosine in the second quadrant is negative, so we affix the negative. So we have a negative four times a negative one times the cosine of pi over four, which is one over root two, which is two root two. So it doesn't matter if we don't make this translation here in, from the negative R to the positive R, we still get the same response. And that's what I wanted to focus on here. I noticed when I started to do this, I'm thinking that, that you know, I need to say a little bit more about this because I didn't, I didn't mean to say that when you do this problem, let me just cover this up. When you do this problem, I'm not saying that you have to change this to this. You don't have to. But I thought it would be convenient to actually show you the translation that I've already defined. But if you just started with this and moved to here, you'll get this answer. Had you done the translation, you get the same answer and you get two root two comma two root two element of the first quadrant. Okay, so these are all equivalent. So, so again, I wasn't saying that when you see this, you have to do this, but ladies and gentlemen, if you would prefer when we, when we do our polar graphs, we're always gonna think this way so we can actually get the point graph because this is not going to uh, confound the algebra but as far as plotting the point, you'll have to think, okay, what does that mean? What is this point? Then you've got to think of the translation. So I'm, I'm kind of a creature of habit that says, if I don't think of it this way, it's gonna be kind of difficult for me to plot the point. So that was my motivation here, but it's certainly not required, okay? So just keep that in mind as you're doing the algebra. I mean, if it were required, then, then our definition would clearly not be very useful. Okay, so that's what happens when I make up problems. I have to, have to kind of cover myself and make sure that all the ideas are correct. Now, what I have here, uh, I've got a couple. It said write two sets of polar coordinates uh, in the appropriate uh, interval here. So this is what I was talking about before. Here's another one. These, these are all busy work problems, but they're important. So here's where we start, negative five, negative five root three. These are Cartesian, Cartesian. And the problem says write uh, two polar forms with theta living here. Now, of course, if you couldn't do it, the, the problem wouldn't be asked or stated this way. So, so here we're starting with before, if you think about what we did, we started with the polar, okay? Now, of course, we can start with the Cartesian and go in the other direction. So now remember, we have what? Uh, Cartesian to polar. So we have what? We have inverse tangent y over x gives us the theta. And then we have uh, the principal square root of x squared plus y squared gives us the r, at least thinking about just the ones in absolute value. So when we, when we do this, we're thinking, okay, well, let's work backwards. So first, first just notice, uh, where does this live? I mean, this is just trigonometry all over again. It's when I had students last semester would send me emails. Well, this is clearly in the third quadrant, decrying the fact that they didn't take my pre-cal class. I said, well, that's your issue. If you avoided me because you thought I was too difficult, that was your choice. Uh, but they think now, uh, had they taken me for pre-cal, Cal 2 would have been easier. And I tend to agree. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, no matter what math you've had, 
you just have to have a foundational understanding. Not You don't have to know everything. You just have to be able to deconstruct things because you have a basic understanding. And, and, and w when I say basic, most, most students will think, well, that doesn't mean much. No, 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 no. Basic is fundamental. Fundamental is actually quite a bit. It's just been degraded to a level of non-existence. But that's what I, that's what I always use when I do my mathematics. And, and it's just a way of thinking. So now when you look at this and you're thinking, well, this is in the third quadrant. So we're gonna need to make sure that our mathematics resides similarly here. So now if we think, okay, let's go over here. So we've got theta, this equals inverse tangent of negative five over root three and then negative five. And we know where this lives, so we may have to make an adjustment. So this is inverse tangent. And of course, the negatives absorb, the fives absorb, so we have the square root of three. Well, of course, that's when the sine is root three over uh, two, so this is pi over three, right? Okay, now here's the thing. This is, this is in the first quadrant. That's not any good, so we have to, we have to adjust it. So we're gonna say pi over three this particular solution is congruent to pi over three plus pi, which is four pi over three. So, so again, this is in the third quadrant. So don't do like my Cal three students last summer that would miss these problems in spherical coordinates. I'm like, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen, this is trig. They said, well, this is what my calculator gave me. I said, that's the problem. You're using, you're using your calculator as the end all. I said, the calculator is only going to give you a value that lives in the range of the inverse tangent function, which is what negative pi over two to pi over two. And so if that's all you have, then you may have to make an adjustment. And they, it made them so mad. I said, well, no, now you know, now you know. You can't just look at the calculator and think, well, this, is, this is, must be right. It's only correct when you consider the range here. So now when we, we think, well, we've got that part. So now let's go to the R. So we have R squared will be what? Negative five squared plus negative five root three squared. So this is what a, what equals 25 plus 25 times three. Well, I could factor this, but that's just a hundred, right? So this will imply that the principal square root of 100 is 10, which is R. And so this is gonna give us a positive value of R, which is fine. Now, now what does this give us? So it says we want two polar forms. So, so what we can say, and, and this, is, this is the key, ladies and gentlemen, this is where theta has to live. This is not saying anything about R, R will be whatever it needs to be so that this is true. So the first one, we, we're good. We've got 10, four pi over three. And now we're thinking, well, how can we get, how can we get another one? Well, we can, we can shoot through the origin, so to speak, uh, with the negative value and add a multiple or subtract a multiple. Like I say, the, the minus pi and the plus pi tend to be the most popular because this put, they push us in directions that give us what we need. So now we can do negative 10 and subtract a multiple of pi. So we'll say uh, what pi over three. So when you look at this, this is just using the definition of negative r. So notice, so note, four pi over three minus pi is pi over three. And that's what we have right here. So this gives us the two polar forms where thetas live in the required range. So, so again, when you, when you look at this, these represent the same point, but they're just saying, okay, polar coordinates are not what? Unique, all right? And that can be a thorn in your side at times, but the fact that they aren't unique is, is what 
gives every new trig student issues. But the, the beauty of that is that when you, when you consider flexibility, uh, polar coordinates are just that. And, and we love our trig, okay? Our trig, you know, makes our lives easier. So, so this kind of gives you a, a, a leg up on what you need to do with this. Now, um, what, about, what about some things that, that might be interesting here? Um, we want to talk about some polar graphs when it comes to, let's see here, this is, let's see, did I mark this? Yeah, I just marked that. Okay, so here, Cartesian, I've got this. And yeah, I just mis mislabeled these. Let me just make sure. Lots of times when I'm labeling my, my work, I'll, I'll use a, I'll get off one number and think I've left out a sheet, but I didn't. So here's, here's an example. For instance, so far you're thinking, well, Professor Ron, you've given us polar coordinates and it's just something else to learn. Who cares? Well, here's, here's something. Look at this, R equals four, okay? So if you looked at that, you're thinking, okay, well, what does that represent? Well, again, this is what we call a polar equation. Polar equation. So we're, we're basically thinking R equals R of theta, okay? And so, so when we look at this, we can think of this kind of like, you know, Cartesian. And, and we're, we're thinking, okay, well, what we can do is we can take this and then we can move it into the Cartesian form. That is, if this is the polar coordinate, then we know X is R cosine theta and Y is R sine theta, and then boom, parametric, parametric. And then from parametric, we can get dy dx. So, so we wanna start thinking about polar curves where we can actually write R as a function of theta. So this is a polar equation. So when we, when we look at this, we see it's like having it's like having x equals four. What does that say if we're in the plane with Cartesian? That means y is free. So we end up with a what? A vertical line because y can be any value. Notice here, theta is free. Remember back in college algebra when you thought you knew something and you you didn't know much at all, but you 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 realize that if you didn't know college algebra, calculus would be really difficult. I always say you learned everything you needed to know in college algebra, maybe, maybe, right? So, so when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, if theta is free, then, then R, if it's fixed at four, can be oriented in any coordinate plane. So you're getting a circle. So basically here, you're thinking, okay, if we think about the polar axis here, and we just mark off, say, two, four, and then two, four, just thinking about distances for R, two, four, two, four. And then you're thinking, okay, well, I could have, I could have a point here. This would be four, zero. I mean, we won't have to do this again. This is, should be obvious. This would be four pi over two. That would be one representation. This would be four pi. And this would be four, three pi over two. Well, I think I need a new, new red pen. I've got millions of pens here, Amazon. I keep Amazon in business. Well, good. So three pi over two. But of course, if we just kept doing this, we would generate all of these points on the circle. Now, of course, I didn't have to make such a big deal about this, but I think it's important. So, 
So when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, R equal four in polar coordinates is just the circle. In this case, this corresponds to X squared plus Y squared equals 16. But that's not at all a surprise. That's not at all a surprise. You could say, well, Professor Ron, I, I was five yards ahead of you with this problem because you looked at that and said, well, I can just convert to what? Cartesian. So R is what the square root of X squared plus Y squared equals four. And then you, 14, right? Not, not quite, four. And then implicitly gives you this. And we usually like to write our circles. For instance, this is the upper arc and this gives you both arcs in the implicit, implicit setting. So you can see that as you go from here to here, you indeed get the circle centered at the origin of radius four. So, so you're thinking, okay, well, we don't, not that we mind this equation, this is indeed a lot simpler. The idea is that polar equations can often be much simpler and easier to work with. But we like our Cartesian because we've been raised with Cartesian. So, so now you can see that, that the idea here is, is not completely crazy, that there are certain curves that we find in our work in mathematics and engineering that are much more suited uh, to the polar representation. Now, of course, you might think, okay, well, here's another simple example. We could have theta equals pi over four as a polar equation. Now, of course, this is kind of off the beaten path. We don't, this is not like what we have up here, which is really going to be our focus, but I don't want to discriminate here. This just basically says here that R is free. And so if you've got a fixed, if you've got a fixed theta, then R can, can be any value. So you get your polar axis here. There's our pi over two, and so we can think pi over four. And so of course, R, R can be any value. So here we can think of R being, you know, positive like a one here. You know, we will think, you know, we've got what one pi over four. And then we could have negative one. Uh, again, we can do a, a, the, for instance, we can look at this and say, okay, this would be the, the uh, equivalent to this. We'd say three pi over four, that would be equivalent point there. So we could get all of these here. So we can go this way. So this would be theta equals pi over four. Now, now we're thinking, so these are all these values are. So, so we're thinking, what if we had, what if we had something like this? What if we had, um, let's see here, negative three pi over four. Well, what's that gonna be? Well, that's going to be, let's take the translation. That'll be three and then add a multiple of pi, three pi over four. So, oh, excuse me, being five pi over four, one plus a four is actually five. I think you all know that. And so here we could say, let me just extend this. So here's our pi over four and then add uh, pi and we could do this here. So maybe I'll think of this point as this will be negative three pi over four. And this point, just like what I was doing up here, and this point would be uh, this one, one pi over four. So, so if I just kept doing what I did up here and, and put all kinds of different values of R, I would, I would get this line. So now what we can do is just extend the red all the way. 
So what we're seeing is that if we have a fixed theta, the theta is going to represent a line. Okay. And so that may be quite useful depending on what kind of construct you're using. So, so there, there are certain things about polar coordinates, and this is only the tip of the iceberg that we find to be very useful here. So, so polar coordinates are actually quite unique in the sense that they do allow us to make representations that are, that are simple and focused. So, so fixed values of the radius or R give you circle centered at the origin and fixed values of thetas give you uh, lines through the origin, okay? And then of course you can, you can again, apply your uh, uh, inverse tangent and get what Y equal X, right? So you're thinking, well, this would be easy to do. This would say inverse tangent of Y over X equals pi over four if and only if applying tangent y over x equals tangent of pi over four, if and only if y over x equals one or the standard equation y equals x, which is this line right here. So if you had to do all of that, you're thinking, well, I'll just start with this. But, but if your, your work would, would be made simpler by thinking of the line this way, then this would be a nice way to do it. And you could see the easy uh, uh, justification for that. So this is all, you can think of this just in terms of plotting the points and thinking about the analytic geometry, or you can, you can do the analytical part more with the uh, algebraic part and look here or look here. So you're thinking, well, I'm not even gonna think about this. I'm just gonna translate it and see what I get. Sometimes the translation might be a big mess and it, it doesn't help you at all. Okay, so, so it's not always the case that the translation process will be simple. Now, the one thing I wanted to note before we get to some interesting polar graphs is that if we have the conversion formulas, we can also uh, write our calculus for the Cartesian derivative. So for instance, we know when we think of the conversion of polar to Cartesian, we have x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. So when you look at these two equations, these are, these are parametric. So this gives us parametric, parametric representation. So this is the, the Cartesian equivalent of the polar coordinate transformation, which you'll do more of in uh, calculus three. So this is the Cartesian equivalent. So we can, and of course I can't, I can't reuse R, which is what I love to use. I'll just, I'll just call this, maybe if, if you wanna think of it, just think of it without that representation now, we'll just do R cosine theta, R sine theta, and not, not use the R this time like I did on the test and just think of it this way. That way we're not introducing another letter, which sometimes some mathematicians like to introduce so many letters, you don't even know what you're doing. So let's minimize that. So now we're thinking, how do we do the Cartesian? Well, if we're thinking about the regular old Cartesian derivative, this would just be the Y prime relative to theta, X prime relative to theta. So this is R sine theta prime, where again, R is a function of theta, okay? And of course, theta is a function of theta. So this is not ambiguous when I put the prime here because we're only dealing with functions that are uh, dependent upon theta. And then we have R uh, cosine theta. Okay, so now we're thinking, all right, well, this is so easy. We can do this, we'll just apply the product rule. So we have R prime sine theta plus R, and then the derivative of sine is cosine. 
And then of course, apply the product rule. Again, we have R prime cosine theta. And then of course, the derivative of, of cosine is negative sine R sine theta. So now we have the Cartesian equivalent of the parametric representation of polar coordinates. And when I say the Cartesian equivalent, the Cartesian equivalent of the uh, Cartesian derivative. So, so again, <laughs> that, that one result using um, the chain rule and the inverse function theorem that gave us this has turned out to be a huge result. And, and that's, that's why calculus has become such a big part of STEM, or at least became the huge part it is in, in, in science, because the calculus, the study of infinitesimals, the basically instantaneous rate of change, just, you know, it, it, it took the science and mathematics community by storm. I mean, when it was discovered, even before people actually wrote it down and said, this is what it is, when Newton and Leibniz said, okay, this is what it is. Um, it was changing the world and how we thought about things. And, and even the Greeks used infinitesimals. They just didn't call it this. They, they probably could have come up with something maybe, but they didn't. Uh, I, I, think, I think their, their line of reasoning uh, was kind of like uh, Ramanujan. They came up with all these beautiful formulas and, and then later on, thousands of years later, everybody verifies that they were indeed correct. So, so, so now what you see is that we can think of this as a theorem. That is now if we're looking for the Cartesian derivative in terms of the polar coordinate representation. So this is our parametric set of parametric equations for the polar coordinate uh, representation in terms of Cartesian coordinates. So that gives us the Cartesian derivative right here. And then of course, here's the next one, the theorem, which I thought is kind of interesting. Dr. Larson mentions it, but it's called tangent lines at the pole. Tangent lines at the pole. Well, this would, this would be the case that you would have a curve that would pass through the pole, zero, zero, all right? But then you're thinking, okay, if, if, I need, if I need the tangent line at the pole, I've got to have its derivative here, okay? So in that case, if, if that were the case in, in this particular situation, I would have this curve. So I've got, I've got what R equals R theta, just like we were talking about before, where for some specific alpha, and I'll just say where for fixed alpha, this is a specific alpha that is, is germane to the actual function um, we have what uh, R prime. Well, let's not let's not go too quick. Let's do it in order. R of alpha would have to be zero, right? Because it's got to be at the pole. We got to stay at the pole if we're doing a distance from the pole. But we want to stay at the pole. The distance had better be zero. Okay. And then then it would require also looking at this that R prime of alpha would be non-zero. Then the equation, the equation of the tangent line at the pole is now here's here's what we get and and it, it's it's like okay hmm, is that what we just talked about absolutely is the line the tangent line it, this is not a surprise when I write this I'm sure okay now the the book doesn't 
kind of look at it this way, but but you know how I take things and I put my own signature on them so they make more sense. Um, this is a line. I already talked about that. This is a line through the origin. So you're thinking, oh, okay, okay. So if we have if we have a value of the derivative of the polar equation, non-zero, and the equation passes through the pole. Now here's the thing, kids. We 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 want to make sure that the the this expression is defined. Otherwise, we end up with the cusp. It's like if we get y prime and x prime both zero, then that's a point or a cusp, and you can't really define a tangent line. So this is kind of keeping us along those lines, which, which, which we've talked about before when you talk about classifying vertical points of vertical tangency and points of horizontal tangency. We, can't, we have to kick out the cases where the x prime and the y prime are both zero, because that's not a, a bona fide uh, line of tangency. Okay, so when we look at this, we're thinking, oh, oh, okay, so, so we, can, we can actually get tangent lines at the pole just by verifying this. Let me say that one more time. If, if you're looking for tangent lines at the pole, if indeed they exist, first you set the polar equation equal to zero and find any alpha that will solve it. Then you compute R prime and, and then see, verify that this is true. And if this is true, boom, there's a tangent line at the pole. Maybe there are two of these for which this is true, then you have two tangents, okay? So, so what's nice about this result is that it doesn't require lots of work. I mean, let's, let's think about it. We don't actually have to compute the Cartesian derivative like we would in calculus one. We just have to focus on the polar equation and make sure that these two hypotheses are satisfied. And then we get an equation of a tangent line. Now you're thinking, um, what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, let's just see why this is true. And this, this is easy and I've told you the recipe so you can use this in your homework. But now if you look up here, this implies that dy dx, and in this case where we have theta equals alpha, well, now we can just run right through it. Notice R of alpha is zero, so that zeroes out. So, so we've got what? R prime of alpha sine alpha plus R of alpha. I mean, this is so easy, it's difficult. Cosine of alpha. And then we have R prime of alpha cosine of alpha minus R of alpha sine of alpha. Well, R of alpha is zero, so both of these are zero here. And then of course, these are non-zero. So these just absorb, so we get R prime of alpha, R prime of alpha, and then we have sine alpha divided by cosine alpha. So this just equals what? Absorb tangent alpha, since these absorb. And of course it makes sense. And then you're thinking, okay, the Cartesian derivative is tangent alpha. But then what does this say? If and only if, now, now when you're thinking, okay, well, th this is gonna be what? Y minus, you know, Y1 equals M times x minus x1. So when you look at this and you think of the Cartesian equivalents, x and y are both zero, the x1 and the y1 are both zero. So this just basically gives you what? y equals tangent alpha times x. So, so now what we see is that we just basically have a line through the origin of slope tangent alpha, which is exactly that, if and only if. Oh, sorry. If and only if alpha 
theta equals alpha, as I declared there. So, so the thing, the thing that we're seeing here is that this this seems so simple that it like well we must have cheated, but now we see all the calculus innervates all of these new coordinate systems or this new coordinate system, and we see that we have a simple way of figuring out tangent lines at the pole. Well, again, maybe not earth shattering, probably not, but when you think about it, it is certainly a result of the Cartesian derivative or the parametric representation that we've been doing all along. So I think that's kind of nifty. So, so that gives you a, a nice way. So, so basically here, when you look at this, th this is the same thing. So we basically see that for points, I'll just re re recap this, points of vertical tangency. Points of vertical tangency. When we think about this, this is going to be, okay, well, if we, if we check here, this means that X prime, in this case, equals zero. And Y prime does not equal zero. And then points, so we find all values of theta that satisfy this, points of horizontal tangency. This will say that y prime is zero and x prime is non-zero. So if you get to a point where you've got the x prime and the y prime both zero, then that, that's kicked out because that's gonna define a cusp or a point and that will not be a place where a tangent line can even be constructed. Okay, so that's important. And this is just like what we had before. There's absolutely no difference. But, but it's usually not as hard when you're dealing with, with polar curves because they're, they're, they're simpler, all right? So, so none of this has changed. This is all the same. This is just an additional uh, result that we get uh, that, that seems to be rather interesting. And there are times when I'm like, oh, no big deal. It's not a very important result. But, but the thing is, is that by thinking about this, that helps you think about lines as constant values of theta and how you uh, intertwine uh, the Cartesian derivative to get the same result here. So, so there is a nice connection here that, that I think helps. Now, when it comes to certain types of curves, for instance, there, there and I want you to print this out, there's in, in section, uh, 10.4, you've got a nice, at the end of the section, you've got a really nice table of special kinds of polar curves. And, and this is what I like about this particular text. It says several important types of graphs have equations that are simpler in polar form than in rectangular. Of course, rectangular being Cartesian, okay? And, and, and it's nice to print these in the, uh, landscape form so that you get everything. A lot of times the, 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 the standard form uh, that you have uh, will, will cut things off as you found out when you were trying to print the uh, power series from uh, chapter nine. Now what this does is it just showcases the limassons, the rose curves, circles, and lenniscates. And this gives you a nice summary of these types of curves, which are actually quite simple. Okay, so I want to I want to talk about some of these. So so we're thinking if if there's certain curves that are simpler in in terms of polar, then let's let's take advantage of that. So I've got some examples here. So the first type of curve here, if we go to our list, is going to be uh, let's see what I want to do first. The Limasson. So the Limasson can be A, A and B are positive, plus or minus B cosine theta. So the thing is, depending on the values or the magnitudes of A, you can get the cardioid, which is the heart shape. You can get 
basically that they just look like circles that didn't quite make it. And then of course you can have an inner loop in this case where A over B is less than one, but you don't have to memorize this. If you have the chart, you can look at it and say, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna get this, but let me, let me, let me verify that. So let's do a limason. Now, of course, if you don't remember the name of it, that doesn't matter. So for instance, example, we'll say, sketch, sketch the polar equation. Well, I'll just say, we're not really, let me write it correctly. Sketch the graph of the polar equation. So now, the, the thing is, it, when, when you look at this and you're thinking, okay, well, Professor Ron, you told us this, this was so much simpler if we think of it this way. And, and, and this was an interesting example. So here the A and the B are equal. So you're expected to get the heart, the cardioid, okay? So you're thinking if we get the heart, then at that particular point, we get a cusp, okay? Because you've got that point. And you're thinking the X prime and the Y prime must simultaneously be zero. That's when we know that occurs. So, so how, can we, how can we use what we know about Cartesian graphs to get a quick graph of this? Now, what I want to say is that, I'll just say, we expect a Lima-san, Lima-san, this is the Cedil, uh, the soft C uh, in, in French, and, and they're similar in Spanish. But, but the, it's not Limacon, it's Limacon. And then we'll say we have A equals B. So this implies the cardioid or the heart shape. And um, let's see. Uh, did I, let's see here. Car, yeah, cardi, car, yeah, I, it, it would it help if I would like spell it right. Cardioid, I need the O first, O-I-D, here we go. Cardioid, not, not cardi, whatever I wrote was wrong. So cardioid, okay. So again, we'll just say heart, the heart. So what's the simple way to actually graph this using the fact that it's actually simpler in the polar form. What this basically means, ladies and gentlemen, if you convert this to Cartesian, it's like, what is this? This is worse than a branch of a hyperbola. You know, it's like, it doesn't fit any pattern I know. So, so the idea is that if you try to convert, you're like, this isn't helping. So what we can do is a, is a tried and true technique it doesn't require that you plot 5,000 points. It just says, think of this as a Cartesian graph. Think of, and, and this makes for a quick polar graph. So think of R equal R theta is a Cartesian graph. And so what we have, and this is easy to draw, we've got what four and we have eight, obviously. So this is four plus four cosine theta. So we can do in the period, of course, is two pi. And I think that'll be enough. We'll have uh, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi. I mean, this is really easy. And so now, of course, when uh, theta is zero, we just get four plus four. Uh, and I'll zero pi over two, pi, three pi over two, two pi. And when theta is pi over two, this zeroes out and we just get four. And then of course at uh, pi, we get a negative four plus a four. So we're still non-negative. And then of course, back up here at three pi over two and then back up to eight at two pi. So let's just go ahead and fill this in.
So when it comes to just, I mean, you're thinking this is like really simple, uh, really, really simple pre-cal. I, I wouldn't even put a problem this easy on a pre-cal test. I mean, if I had them do a, do a uh, transformation, it would be a lot harder than this. But of course, we'd have a shift, a horizontal shift where they had to work a little. So, so these graphs are like pitifully simple. But that's the thing. The polar graph is so easy. The, the polar equation is so simple. And because of its simplicity here, we can now look at this as just varying values of R, which we can now interpret in terms of the values of the theta. And of course, if we get a negative R, we'll just shoot through the origin and interpret it as we've defined uh, the polar coordinates for negative values of R. So here's an R here. Here's an R here of length four. So we got an eight, a four, a zero. We have a four, and then we have back to eight. So these are values of R here that we can get from the Cartesian. So, so we think Cartesian, and then we transfer this to polar. Now, when you do the polar graph, do this. Go ahead and, and draw the polar axis here. And then you can just dot things like this. I mean, if you just want to draw them solid lines, that's fine. I usually do that in some of my lecture notes, but I, I don't think it matters. And it's certainly, I, I don't care. So, so, so now you can think, all right, well, we've got what a value of eight. So you can mark off four and then eight. So that's where we're going to start. And then as we get to pi over two, the value is four. So it's, it's, to the other side here, we're still, we're still, you know, you know, eight, seven, six, five, four. So when we think about this, we're we're moving around until we hit this point where we basically decrease to it. So we're thinking, okay, well, we're coming around. So then we decrease to it. So we've got these values here, and then. Then as we move to pi, we, we have a zero value. So we're doing something like this, zero value. So, so now what we're seeing is eight, zero. So this is eight comma zero. And then to this point, this is what? Four pi over two. You don't have to mark these off if you don't want to. And then we've got what? zero pi. And now we've got three pi over two, four. So we'll just do the same thing here. So you're thinking we've got some symmetry going on along. I'll show you how you figure that out. But you can see that it's going to be symmetric just by looking at the Cartesian graph. And then basically the same. So there's our heart. So now you can see if you look at it this way, you get the heart shape, but you see it's it's on its side, so to speak. So this is the cardioid. Now notice how simple this was by thinking of the polar equation. This was easy. And now you can see that if we think of the R associated with the theta and then translate the negative R like we've defined, then this is not difficult to do. Now, what you, what you see here is you're thinking, well, Professor Ron, this, this particular graph looks symmetric to the y-axis or, or excuse me, the x-axis or the polar axis. You're thinking if you looked at this in college algebra, well, not college algebra, that not that too advanced. But if you looked at this like as a curve, you would say this is clearly not a function, but as a curve, you're saying this curve is, is symmetric relative to the horizontal axis. And so you're thinking, well, how, 
how would you think about that? Well, just take a point like right here. You think of this as R theta, and you think of this point here, this bump down here. You think of this point as R negative theta. So of course, if, if you could substitute these values here, and not change the equation, then you would necessarily have what you call symmetry relative to the x-axis or the polar axis. But then of course you could say, well, I could do what negative r and then do theta minus or, or pi minus theta, that would be equivalent to this. So for instance, if you could substitute either of these uh, in for r and get the same equation resulting, then you would know you would have symmetry and let's just show that. I mean, th this is not earth shattering. I mean, you can see that it's going to be that just by looking at this. But if you wanted to verify this based on the polar graph, you could say replace, replace R theta. We'll just do the easy one. Or what, let's just, let's do this one and we can do our difference formula for our uh, cosine. But of course, you can do that one and get the same result. So we've got what? We have negative r equals 4 minus 4 cosine theta minus pi. So again, here we just said, well, what, what's a you know, how can we how can we rig this? We can just add a multiple of pi or we could subtract either way. So we've got negative r equals four minus. So now we've got four. So this will be, co I'll just go ahead and write this out. Cosine pi, sine pi, plus um, cosine, uh, oh, ding. Sorry, theta, my pre-cal students. Oh, Professor Ron. Yeah, they, they're, all, they, they're like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not perfect. And then of course, we'll have what uh, sine, sine, well, I, I, you know, kids, I'll get it eventually. I'll get it eventually. What is math is self-correcting? There we go. And then plus. There we go. So, so remember, it, since I messed this up so much, let me just remind you what this is. Cosine A minus B, we know this, cosine A, cosine B, plus sine A, sine B. The beauty about it is that if you write it wrong, it self-corrects you. So here, of course, we're taking A to be pi and we're taking B to be theta. So we get a cosine, pi, excuse me, cosine of pi, cosine theta, plus sine of theta, uh, sine of pi. So that's exactly what I've written here. So, so the, the thing, and, and of course, if I, if I did it completely uh, uh, symmetric, I put the pi first and then the theta, but, but you'll give me the slack that I can commute those. So this is negative r equals, let's see here, uh, four minus four. And then I've got a cosine of, a pi, which is negative one. So this is gonna be a negative cosine theta. And then of course we've got sine of pi, so that's plus a zero. And so now we've got negative r equals four minus four times the negative one cosine theta. And so now we've got negative r equals four plus four cosine theta. Now, of course, this is where you're thinking well, we've got the negative here, but this doesn't make any difference because if we, if we, if we did this, we get the same thing. We just have the negative absorbing and then we just have four plus four cosine theta. That would be the easy one. But of course I chose to do 
uh, the more difficult one. But here, when you've got the negative R, this won't make any difference. This just makes the fact that all of this just gets reflected uh, basically through the origin. So when we start here, if we have a negative R uh, here, you know, with, with the zero, then, then we get a reflected graph. Now, again, when, when you think about this and you consider what we've done, let me just write this here. This would be traversal in the opposite direction. So this is what I wrote right here. I did a little sketch at the beginning of the lecture where we thought about x-axis symmetry where we could do this or we could do this. This would be the quickest one to do. But the thing is, the thing is, is that if you actually traverse the curve in an opposite direction, that's not a bad thing. It just, it just is kind of awkward. So this traversal in the opposite direction, and I'll just say does not, let me write this so you can read it, does not change the curve, not change output of curve. So, so again, the, the interesting thing here is that if you look at this, this is not at all a surprise. But, but we, we're not normally used to looking at the Cartesian and going to the polar and making those kinds of deductions. So we can think of this in terms of symmetry relative to the polar or x-axis. You can use either of these. And the, the, thing, the thing that's so interesting about all of this is that when we, when we consider it and we consider what we're doing, um, it is often the case that, and, and here's, a, here's another example of this. Say we have uh, R equals four, okay? We know what that is. Here, here's, an, here's a simpler example of this so you can see this. We know this is the circle at the origin, right? So that's this right here. I just draw this kind of, you know, pedestrian right here. You get this. Now, what about, what about this? What about this? What curve is that? Well, when you look at this, this is just, we, we, take, the, we take the interpretation of this and we think, well, this would just be traversal in a different direction because we could say, all right, simply, this is also when, 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 when we think about this R equals negative four or R equals the additive inverse of four. And so this would be traversal in an opposite direction. So when we draw it, We still get the same curve, but it would just be riding the curve in a different direction. So, so when we take the negative of the additive inverse of, of the polar curve, we don't necessarily generate a different curve. We basically traverse in an opposite so-called direction. So, so the, the, thing, the thing that's interesting here is that if you want a really simple example, Think of this one. Now, now another thing too is that when you when you were working with these curves, one one estimation may actually give you a simpler result than another, and then you have to work a little bit harder to figure out that you actually get an equivalent result. So this is what I'm trying to show you here that that this is not a surprise, and and maybe if you want to start out do the easier one first, and then you can look at this like what we did here and see that we actually get the same result, but we get the tracing of the curve in an opposite so-called direction. 
Now, there's one other curve that I want to do, and I'm, I, I'm actually going to do another curve uh, when we start our lecture next time, but this is called the Rose Curve. And this is actually going to have, uh, well, it's not going to have origin symmetry. It's, it's just going to have its own, own style, so to speak. This will be R equals four cosine three theta. Now, one thing about the Rose Curves is that, and this is just based on trigonometry, when the coefficient here in this particular case of theta is odd, we get n pedals. But when it's actually even like a two or a four, you get two n pedals. And that's just uh, basically uh, based upon the, uh, the trigonometric equation. And so the, the parity of the actual coefficient tells you how many pedals you're going to have. But that's all based on solving trigonometric equations. It's nothing amazing going on. So when we look at this, we're thinking, OK, well, this is a rose curve. Remember, the rose curves in the more general setting, like I so showed you right here, this will be a cosine n theta or a sine n theta. So the more general setting is R equals A cosine N theta. And here N is odd. And this corresponds to N petals. But you don't even have to memorize that. The trigonometry will tell you. The trigonometry will tell you. And then we're going to do this the same way. This this, in terms of the polar equation, is simple. And, this, and why do we look at the Cartesian? Because the Cartesian allows us to drag in our trigonometry, which we know, and then transfer that, just like we did here, transfer that to the cardioid, very simply. So, Let's do the same thing here. Notice the period of this function is going to be decreased. This will just be 2 pi divided by 3. <clears throat> and then, of course, we can break it up into four simple pieces. So 2 pi, 3 times 1 fourth. That'll just give us pi over 6. So we'll just do the intervals of length pi over 6. So we can get a nice cheap. Uh, Cartesian curve. Now, again, we may have to draw a little bit more of it to, to get the entire curve, but not much because we've decreased the period. We'll just exhaust it and draw as many as we think we might need. And if we need a few extra, we'll tack it on. So here we've got what zero, we've got pi over six, two pi over six, 3 pi over 6, just keep it unreduced, 4 pi over 6. Of course, that's 2 pi over 3, and we'll just type a few more. 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6. So just draw it as many as you think you might need. You may not need all of these. And then, of course, we can, we can go ahead and, as principal points, we'll do four will be the maximum. And then, of course, we're going to have some negative values here. We get to use our interpretation of negative r. Again, a, a negative r, in terms of a polar equation, doesn't, doesn't do anything except forces you to trace the curve in a different direction, not like in the Cartesian sense of, of a reflection. So now, now what we see is that we've got what? Four, and then, then we move through, we get our zero. We get our negative four, zero, back to four. And then a zero, negative, back to four. We'll see if we need all of this, but you have to usually put in a few more periods than just one for the rose curves. So let's go ahead and draw this. Now all this little extra work here is more than worth it. 
So what are you gonna do? Just plot a bunch of points and have no idea what it means? This way you have something that's actually uh, organized. Polar coordinates are not simple, but let's see here. And so now the, let's see, we've got the uh, one, two, and then, oh, I need to hit zero and then we're up here. So yeah, twice that is that. So I need to be here first. There we go. Kind of like the addition formula for cosine or the subtraction formula. You write it down incorrectly enough times, you'll eventually uh, get the correct one. Math, math is self-correcting, fortunately, right? So now we have, we have a value of four, then we have a zero value. Now we have our first negative value. So we're gonna shoot through the origin. We have a zero and then we have a plus, we have another zero. Now, of course, these are gonna be uh, tangents at the pole, right? As long as we don't have cusps, these will be tangents at the pole that we get for free. These are tangents at the pole right here. And so now let's go ahead and draw our picture. So if you like, do your polar axis. And you can dot the rest in if that makes you feel better. Again, we're doing a polar plane, but we're typing in the, the axes so we can see them. So now we're gonna start out at four. So we'll just say two, four. And then notice here, this is just pi over three, two pi over six, and this is two pi over three. So at pi over six, and then here, here's what we can do. We can just go ahead and, 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 and get a, a cheap estimate here. So um, let's see, we'll do our, mark this off here as like a four. We'll get like a pi over four. And then for the, uh, let's see here, kind of a guesstimate. So here we'll do about, That'd be pi over six, and we'll do like about a about right here. They're not equidistant here, but we'll do like a pi over three about right here. So here, pi over six, so we'll mark in these. This doesn't have to be a work of art, just relative magnitudes. So pi over three, and then here, two pi over three, so about right. Sometimes it's good to go ahead and mark these in to have just a, a bearing as you sketch this. So we've got two pi over three, and then we've got pi over six. And then five pi over six, again, just a little bearing here. Pi pi over six. And then let's see that, that we'll start with this. And then if we need some more, we'll draw it in. And then of course, uh, when we get when we get to here, and I'll show you what we need to do there. So we start out at four right here. We'll sketch with a pencil, then we can darken it in. And then as we move to pi over six, we we move to zero and we're at this angle. So we've got something about like this, forming part of the, the pedal right there. And now at this point, we move into the negative realm, but notice we're at pi over three here, but we're negative. So, so as we, as we, we get here, we're thinking, okay, well, we've got to shoot through the uh, origin, so to speak. And we're like, okay, well, if, if, this is the, if this is the pi over three here, 
and we're negative, then we've got to shoot through the origin. So let's do that. Let me draw that so you can see it. So as we move here, if this were if this were were positive, then we're thinking, you know, we'd be we'd be somewhere up here, but that doesn't make any sense. So here we we just take this value here, think about it this way. So this is negative four pi over three. So this is equivalent to four, add, add your pi, and that gives you a four pi over three. So that takes us here, the interpretation. And so now you can do like your, your two, your four, or your two and your four. So just kind of mark it off right there. So we come down to here. And then, then notice as we get to here, we come back up to pi over two, but notice again, we're at zero, but we are moving again in the negative realm. So again, as we move up through here, where our angles are moving over here closer to pi over two, but we're reflecting through the origin. So that's the, the value of the negative values of R right there, right there. And then at this point, so again, notice here, tangent at the pole, we can go ahead and draw it in, tangent at the pole. Right there, there's a tangent at the pole. And now what we can see as we move back up, we're at what, two pi over three, and I'll mark this off. So we've got like a two and a four. So we curve right up here. to get the two pi over three, and then we move back down to five pi over six, which is right here, back to zero. So again, remember, remember the important thing is, is that we're in the negative values, we're reflecting through the origin. We're not making a loop there, we're making a loop basically reflected through the origin by the definition of the uh, negative values of R. And then notice here, we have to move back around the pi, but we're not here, we're right here. So as we move to this, we have another tangent at the pole, and then we end up closing off right here. Again, we're not over here, we're using the definition of negative R, which puts us here. And so we get another tangent at the pole right here. Now here's another thing, we've got a vertical tangent right here at pi over two. So these are all tangents at the pole. Theta equal pi over two, theta equal pi over six, theta equal five pi over six. We got the tangents at the pole for free. We didn't even have to do any major calculation. But see, you get a three petal rose curve. But this doesn't really have much symmetry. We don't have, we don't have, uh, this petal has symmetry, but the, we, and, and then of course, because my drawing is so bad, it's probably, we do have the x-axis symmetry here. You can see that this should be a little bit more symmetric, a little bit more out like this. So here, if you replace the theta with the negative, you see just like with the last one, we get a nice symmetry here. So this has, this has polar axis symmetry. So what we're seeing here is that the use of the Cartesian helps us to draw this because we can now navigate the negative R's by definition. And then the Cartesian equation gives us the tangents at the pole for free, a Cartesian graph. So trigonometry, pre-cal, from the trigonometric graph to the polar graph is the Cal 2 part. But notice, notice we still have some nice symmetry here, but the beauty of this is that this equation in this form has this interpretation for pre-cal, 
but has this interpretation for the polar curve. And we see this is simpler written this way. If you try to rewrite this with the x's and the y's, you get an equation that's really difficult. Now, there's going to be one other curve I want to talk about at the next lecture, and we're going to take some calculus and apply it to this. We're going to think, can we compute lengths of these curves? Can we compute the area of this pedal here? Can we use area and arc length calculations to actually uh, uh, apply this to the polar coordinate transformation? And the answer is yes, because we have the parametric representation of the polar coordinate transformation. And from section three, we already know how that works. So we're going to apply that. And then we'll be able to compute areas of the polar curves, and we'll be able to compute arc lengths. Again, as long as we abide by the fact that we keep the curve, we, we integrate over smooth parts of the curve and not just mow over uh, uh, infinite discontinuities and cusps, which, which we have a tendency to want to do. OK, so I, I wanted to be very thorough today about the polar coordinates, ladies and gentlemen, because this is this is not overly difficult, <clears throat> but I, I've never met a student who actually had polar co coordinates before Cal 2 that actually knew anything. Oh, I did that. I did that. And basically what it what amounted to was punching a curve in a, in a fancy calculator and getting a response. And I'm thinking that's not knowledge. So, so what I've tried to do is, is, is build this from a foundation of just definitions and the idea of using your trig that you already know and applying it to this. So go ahead and start working on the polar uh, equations and, and think about how this ties into what you already know uh, from your trigonometry. I think you're going to find it's very interesting. And if you look at this, this is so nifty. And so now you can think, wow, look, polar equations, r equals 4 cosine 3 theta. You never thought that if you think of this curve as a polar curve, you get this beautiful rose curve. And so now, now as you future engineers and architects, you can you can design some models, you know, and, and, and may, maybe one day we'll get some architectural designs from some of you for some beautiful buildings that you have designed. So just remember, the math is the route to that. So I hope you've enjoyed this. This is always fun to teach, but everything I teach in math is fun. So thanks for your hard work on the test. There has been marked improvement. All I'm interested in is your improvement, and, and that's good. So keep up the good work, and I'll send out invitations for uh, office hours or conference hours today. And again, thank you for your attendance. Everybody have a good one.